Hello, welcome. My name is Dr. Jamie Green. I am a nephrologist at Geisinger and I'm very excited to be moderating this session. Today we'll be talking about how we can optimize communication between patients or caregivers and the kidney care team to ensure the best outcomes in treatment. Here to help us with the discussion is a great group of individuals that represents a unique piece of the kidney care team. A nephrologist, a dietitian, a nephrology nurse, social worker, and a patient. We've got a full house, so let's meet them all. First, we have Dr. Julie Wright Nunez. Julie is a nephrologist and researcher who focuses on optimizing patient education and support across the continuum of CKD care. Her work strives to improve the health of patients living with CKD and creating primary and secondary interventions to slow or stop complications and risk associated with CKD. Recently, Dr. Wright Nunez developed a platform educating youth about kidney disease within science curriculums and increasing student health literacy. She's living AKF's mission of fighting kidney disease on all fronts. Welcome, Julie. Next up, we have Kathy Wong who joins us today to bring her experience over the last seven years as a registered dietitian. In addition to working with adults on in-center hemodialysis, Kathy provides education to CKD patients prior to starting dialysis regarding kidney disease, how to optimize their health by collaborating with their healthcare team and treatment modalities available. Her passion in helping her patients navigate their diet and how to work with their healthcare team began with her personal journey with Crohn's disease. Thank you so much, Kathy, for being here. Carrie Leach is joining us as a nephrology nurse. Carrie has over 20 years of experience as a healthcare nursing professional. Ms. Leach has her master's in healthcare administration from Webster University, a bachelor of science in nursing from McKendree University, and an associate's degree in applied science nursing from Kentucky State University. She also carries a certificate a certification as a personal life coach. Her work has ranged from working in cardiothoracic care in her early years to working in dialysis as a nephrology nurse. As a regional director of operations with DeVita Kidney Care, while working alongside dynamic staff partners, she has worked on quality clinical care and business operations. We're so happy you could be here today, Carrie. Now I'd like to introduce Shauna Phillips, who is a licensed social worker. Shauna spent about a year and a half working with a small local dialysis provider in Chicago, then transitioned to working in a busy Chicago hospital to gain more extensive medical experience. In the last 18 years, since her return to clinic, she has mostly worked in the same location while periodically assisting at other facilities. She supported in-center, peritoneal, and home hemodialysis units. In addition, she currently serves on the Medical Review Board for ESRD Network 10 and as a chair for the Illinois Council of Nephrology Social Workers. Welcome, Carrie. And last, but certainly not least, I would like to welcome Nicole Jefferson, who's representing the patient voice on our panel today. Nicole was diagnosed with end-stage renal disease in 2003 and experienced both forms of dialysis, both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. On June 12, 2008, she received the gift of life, a kidney transplant. Due to a series of medical challenges that she faced following her transplant, Nicole realized that a transplant was simply another, was simply another form of treatment, but not a cure. This realization initiated her enthusiasm for advocacy, and now she shares her story with her community, underserved population, and speaks with legislators regarding the need for early detection and other issues relating to chronic kidney disease. Thank you so much for being here, Nicole. So throughout our conversation today, we want to hear from you. So feel free to type your questions and comments into the window um, next to or below the Facebook Live video stream, and we'll try to answer as many as possible. A quick reminder that you should speak, you should speak to your care team about specific medical advice um, in the, or in the event you want more information about the latest treatment options for your condition. And while we're waiting for the first few questions to come in, um, we're gonna start talking about some general key takeaways that we want all of you to leave with today. So I will start by, uh, I'm gonna go through them all and then I'll open it up to our panel. 
So the first takeaway is your kidney health depends on you and your healthcare team. Second one is don't hesitate to tell your providers exactly what's going on so that they can know how to best help you. Third, share any symptoms you're experiencing. Uh, tell them how you're feeling both physically, mentally, and emotionally. Fourth, be honest. If you're struggling with any medicines or therapies for any reason, let your kidney care team know. And finally, share your goals for treatment with your team. They can help you balance your therapies with your quality of life and your health goals. So the first question related to these key takeaways is for Dr. Julie Wright Nunez. Um, Julie, working with the healthcare team really is a partnership between us and our patients. What strategies work best when your patients come in to see you for an appointment? Thank you for this question. I think you're so right in emphasizing that kidney care really is a partnership between the patient and all of the providers in the care team. I think there's a few strategies that really, really help. I think one of them is um, just to feel empowered to know who all of the people are in your care team and their role. And whether it be myself as a kidney doctor, uh, working alongside advanced practitioners, pharmacists, social workers, nurses, dietitians, or many others who support the care across the continuum, I think it's important to know that each person has fantastic expertise that they bring. Um, and it's important for, for patients to feel empowered to know who all of those individuals are and to really ask, well, what is your role in my care for you being at the center? I think another strategy that was mentioned a little bit um, earlier, but is just to share your own goals and values in care with your providers. I think sometimes inadvertently, there may be some assumptions as providers or people caring for you that we may make, um, and they're unintended, but it really helps us to know and understand what your goals and values are in care, whether it's being um, staying away from uh, certain foods, whether it's dialysis and thriving, whether it's getting a transplant or just coping with kidney disease. I think it's important to know what those values and goals are that you want to work on. And kind of in line with this, I think prioritizing what those are along with any questions that you have for your providers during visits, I think is really important because I think we're limited with face-to-face -face time in our patients and admittedly may not be able to spend all of the time that we'd like to. So I think coming prepared with questions and prioritizing those for the provider is very helpful. And I find as a provider, I like to ask first, what are your questions at the start of a visit? so I can make sure that I'm getting to them with, with my patients. And then lastly, I think one strategy that can help is bringing a loved one, if it's allowed in the COVID era, whether in person or if on Zoom or phone, I think that they can be there for support, but also to ask questions and then also help with the takeaways from the visit afterwards as well. So those are just a few strategies that I found helpful. Great, that's fantastic. Really wonderful points. Thank you. Okay, the next question I'm going to direct at for Carrie. Um, so nurses are often one of the first members of the care team to talk to a patient at an appointment. Mm. Uh, what are some questions you think every patient should ask? It's interesting because I'm going to um, branch off of Dr. Julie of just saying having those questions ready and prepared. Exactly, what's my condition? What caused it? Because I think it's the more that a patient is empowered to have knowledge around their disease process, then that collaboration with their care provider is just a smoother relationship and, and it grows trust. What to expect with the treatment? How long will I be on treatment? Those are key questions because there's so much to the unknown. What's going to happen around the medication that I'm prescribed? How do the prescriptions work along with my new diagnosis? What symptoms should I be looking for? What do the symptoms mean? How do they align? Those are all key questions that I would say, definitely, when you bring in your care partner or your family member to your appointment, if you're going to have an appointment with Dr. Julie, definitely have that prepared. Know that on front of mind as you attend your appointment. 
Oh, those are great too. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, okay, great. I have some questions for a question for Nicole next. So you've been through just about everything as a, as a kidney patient uh, and everything a patient could go through. So from both types of dialysis to now living with a transplant. For all the other patients out there watching today, what tips do you have for advocating for yourself with the healthcare team? What's been successful for you? Oh, wow. One of the things that has been really successful is my nephrologist team. What I do is I discuss everything that's going on with me. It may seem like a primary care physician question. However, I still present it to them as well and let them know what's going on with me so they can get an entire picture of everything that's going on in my life. Also, one key thing that I do is I listen to my body. When I listen to my body, it's been determined that I know my body actually better than the doctors, nephrologists, and things like that. So if I feel a certain way, or if I feel something is needed that they're not providing, then I will go to another nephrologist or get a second opinion so I can make sure that everything is being addressed. One of the major things that happened to me is when my first transplant started failing, I kept telling my nephrologist that I felt like it was failing. However, my numbers didn't signify that. So I asked for a biopsy and he didn't want to do one. So finally, I just told him, I'll go to another nephrologist that will biopsy me. And he agreed to biopsy me. And based on that biopsy, that's how we found out that that transplant was indeed failing and that I needed to go look for another transplant at that time. So the main thing I say is I do listen to my nephrologist, but I listen to my body also and make my determinations on what needs to happen next. Fantastic. Wow, the patient perspective is so insightful. Uh, uh, particularly, I know as a, as a nephrologist, um, I love hearing the perspective from the patient, so thank you. Um, okay, question for Shauna. Uh, the third takeaway talks about the importance of not just sharing your physical symptoms, but your mental health and emotional symptoms too. Why is this important and what tips do you have for patients on how to share this information? Sure. Um, I think it's vital to share every single symptom, whether it seems like it's physical, whether it seems like it's truly just a medical thing that's happening, because sometimes some of the diagnoses that we're given, they, you know, they have a component that has a mental health component to it. And Sometimes some of those symptoms, people who have had a panic attack, for example, may think something medical is going wrong. They may think they're having a heart attack. They might feel dizzy. They might feel like their heart's racing when it could be something that's anxiety driven. So if we as social workers, if you're telling us all the symptoms you're having, it may seem like maybe you're repeating yourself, you're telling your physician, you're telling your nurse, but sometimes we can offer a different perspective. And even if there is something medical going on, we can also treat some of those symptoms like anxiety or just feeling overwhelmed, feeling depressed, feeling anxious. We can help to moderate some of those symptoms. We can't always get rid of all of them, but a great way to share them is to make sure that you're over communicating. You know, make sure you're communicating with all members of your care team, your dietitian, your social worker, your nurse, your physician, whether there's a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner you know, just share and share and share. If you don't feel comfortable talking about some of these symptoms or any concerns that you have out, if you're an in-center patient and you're in the treatment area, you might not want to talk about these things in front of other patients or the other staff. You're always welcome to reach out to your social worker, either for a private meeting, a phone consultation, any way that you feel comfortable bringing these topics up. And remember that your social workers have training, not only from school, but they also get trained by the companies they work for. They have a whole support system of other social workers. If you happen to bring up something they're not as familiar with, we have a lot of resources, things that we can teach you, ways that you can cope, and also link you with outside resources. So don't ever hesitate to share something, even if it feels uncomfortable to bring it up, because it's very likely we've heard it from a lot of other patients. Great. So, um, well, and your, your last, I guess, sentence probably answered what I was going to follow up on. I think a lot of patients feel that um, they don't want to be the only one bringing up those issues. Would you say then as a social worker that the, the emotional um, and mental health issues are something that comes up a lot with patients? 
You know, over the years, we've heard numbers like 40% of patients at any given moment are experiencing anxiety and depression. It is very common. You know, when you suddenly receive a diagnosis that your kidneys are no longer working and you have to start a treatment, it's a complete overhaul to your life. And we have to expect that this is something that people aren't prepared to cope with. So you may not be at the extreme of having a true diagnosis of depression, but maybe you're just struggling to adapt. Maybe you just need to learn some additional coping skills, but it is extremely common. And we want everyone to know that this is something to expect. It may not happen in the beginning. It may happen after you've been a dialysis for a couple of years. You know, maybe the routine takes its toll. Maybe it's, oh, I never get a break from doing this. And again, we have strategies and we have resources that we can use. There's so much great information out there. And it's completely normal to have those feelings, whether it's in the beginning feeling overwhelmed or a couple of years into the process, or even switching from one modality to another or being on the transplant list. That can seem overwhelming you know, to think about a major surgery and what's the outcome going to be. And in life, we have no guarantees. We have no guarantees if the kidney is going to start working immediately. So there are a lot of strategies to use to help you cope with those feelings that are uncomfortable. And we all know when you feel good, you tend to have more energy. When you are struggling with something, if you're feeling sad or overwhelmed, you tend to have lower energy levels. And we want to make sure that we help maximize your quality of life and help get you through those periods when you really struggle. Great. Wonderful. It's so nice to hear that there are resources available. I think that a lot of people don't realize that. So thank you. Um, Okay. I have a question for Kathy next. Um, The last key takeaway talked about sharing your goals and quality of life. Um, Food. (laughs) It's a very common topic. Uh, I get asked a lot about um, diet. So food is woven into the fabric of our lives and is synonymous with quality of life. What tips do you have for patients on how to communicate the challenges they're having with what they're eating? That's a great question. And that's one of the most common questions, actually. I think the best thing to do is to be honest with your healthcare team. Um, don't be afraid to tell either your doctor, your dietitian, or your nurse um, your particular goals, things, maybe certain foods that you particularly like, but maybe on the back of your mind, you're thinking, well, I've heard that I'm not supposed to eat it. Just set that aside. Let your healthcare team know your honest thoughts. Um, and that way your doctor um, and your dietitian and also your nurse, they can kind of triage you and where to go. Ultimately, hopefully your dietitian can help you navigate your particular um, diet because we all eat slightly differently. Someone can tell you to eat these foods or to stay away from these foods, but if you don't even eat or touch those foods, it's not going to affect you. And so it's best just to be honest, tell your healthcare provider what you're exactly eating, your exact questions, and even if it's related to medication. If you really don't want to start a particular medication or certain medications are making you have various symptoms, make sure to let them know um, because they can maybe help you find other alternatives to help maybe improve your symptoms or just find a different treatment plan for you. Great, really useful tips. Thank you so much. Um, Yeah, I think um, diet questions just come up a lot. So it's great to have you here and provide that input. Okay, well, thank you all of, thanks to all of you. We're now going to move to questions from the audience. And if you're just joining us, thank you for being here and being part of the part of Kidney Action Week. Our current session, talking to your kidney care team for improved outcomes. That's our, our current session. Please join the conversation by typing questions and comments into the window next to or below the Facebook Live video stream, and we'll try to answer as many as possible. So I'll go to a first question. I think this one is directed to Dr. Wright Nunes. So what should I do um, if I have more questions that my doctor says it's time for them, time for me to move on? Thank you, that is such a great question. And I'm going to be honest, that's really tough. Um, 
because we're living in an era where time constraints do exist, whether inside or outside of medicine. And then I think no more uh, are we feeling that pressure than during a pandemic that's ongoing and affecting all of us at so many different levels. So it's a real issue. And I think first and foremost, there are some of us, uh, not only on this session, but across the US who are trying to work on that issue, you know, making sure that there's time needed to spend with our patients instead of a certain number of minutes in the time slot. But in the meantime, I think there's a few things I'd recommend. And we've already mentioned one of them. And that is, if possible, you know, prior to the visit, thinking about questions, preparing for the visit, prioritizing questions, and making them known to your provider right at the onset so they can incorporate some of what they may want to share with you along with responses that you need and answers that you need. I think another thought is that sometimes providers may say they need to move on or get to a different visit. And I think what Nicole said earlier was really powerful on a lot of different levels. You know your body best. And I listen to that. I think any good provider or staff across the continuum of care, that's really powerful. And it may not be quantifiable all the time. Hey, I just feel a little off or a little funny. Maybe the numbers look good. But I think always advocating for self as a patient is kind of what we're getting at. And if there needs to be more time advocating for that, you should feel empowered to do so. Now, maybe there's urgent or emergent situations that a person, a provider must move on to, but in that case, asking for either a follow-up and maybe not a follow-up visit, but a follow-up call. And although we all have different perceptions around portal usage or health portals or emails, I think certainly again in this era and beyond, we're hopefully getting more well-versed in the medical community about yeah. how to support our patients at different levels. And personally, I use health portals and it's a great mechanism for questions, not to put anything off, but if there's ever any follow-up as well. Great question. Well, that actually ties into the next question from, from someone that said, is there any way to contact my doctor in between visits if I only have one or two questions? and it's difficult to make a full appointment. So it sounds like what you're saying is the health portal, if you have access to it or can learn how to get access to it, is a great way to do that in between visits. Um, Absolutely. Do you have any Absolutely. Along with phone calls. And again, you know, everybody has their own sensitivity and what they are used to with technology and their right. own demands of time. And we, uh, again, not every health system is the same, but we have multiple ways that folks can get a hold of us. And I think health portals are fantastic. Or if it's a phone call, that's great. And I guess the only thing to add is to make sure that your provider is giving you a number that you can reach folks at, um, nurses or their staff as well. That's really important. Yeah, thank you. And so in talking about the health portal, I'm wondering as you um, are talking about it, do you find that um, most patients can use the health portal. I know that obviously some people may not have internet access at all, um, but some of my patients I know do, but just they are intimidated by signing up for the health portal. Have you found that it's a, a you know, a, a quick learning curve? <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. I think I respect that, again, different modes of technology are really kind of individualized. Although I think we have a ways to go within the medical community and as a nation to recognize all of that individualization. Um, but yeah. a study that we did and that I think others have corroborated is that people who have kidney disease, it's not 100% of these individuals who may use health portals. And sometimes, honestly, the people that I need access to are people who don't want to use them or don't have access to them or don't feel comfortable or may feel intimidated. And I'll tell you, I've signed up for a portal and I can see sometimes how it might be a little bit scary as well. We're trying to put into place mechanisms so help desk staff and our other clinical staff calling patients to help them through first visits that might be through a portal or just messaging through a portal. Not everybody has that access, but definitely if it is available, I take advantage of it. And I think a key is just letting all of the providers in your team know what you think is the best mechanism for communication. 
again, everybody has their own style, but I'll put it actually in the notes when I'm seeing folks. So everybody in my team, at least who can access that, knows what the best way is to get a hold of folks. And I'd certainly love to hear, I guess, from the social or psychosocial perspectives, anything else that my colleagues um, also in the session think about that. Yeah, I think, you know, social workers are great advocates for patients. And a lot of times we can sit down with someone and walk them through the steps. You know, we love to teach. We love showing people what's available, how to use it, you know, how to, we really want people to feel empowered, to take charge, take, you know, it's their, their life. They should have control. They should be able to make all the decisions that they need to in order to have the best life they can. And if one of those things where there's an area of struggle is technology, that is certainly something that for most of us, I think we can sit down and kind of go through the steps, walk through, you know, even provide maybe even a printed handout, something that you can refer to later so that they can practice using it and just really feel comfortable with what technology is out there. That's great. Great, wonderful. So I have another question. Let's maybe we'll move on to a different topic. Um, question for Carrie. Are care nurses able to help me with getting prescriptions? They are. You know, I will just do some elaborate, uh, say ditto to a lot of what's already been said through care portals, um, health portals, through phone calls, there is assistance with getting your prescriptions. Make sure that you are discussing with your providers, having the phone number that you just need prescription help. Making sure that you discuss with your provider of what that after hour phone call number is in case you have questions around your prescriptions and your medications. And also leverage your pharmacy. Pharmacists have outstanding knowledge around all things renal and how there may be some contraindications to your medications. So between your CVS, Walgreens pharmacist, your health portal, phone calls to the office, definitely nurses can assist. I think Wonderful. I great. I add. do. Yeah, please. Yeah, sometimes also it, um, it's common for, from what I've heard, patients um, expressing sometimes their medications are too expensive for them to afford or mm -hmm. it becomes such a burden for them to to fill a particular medication because of the cost. I think that's also something worth bringing up to your healthcare team. Uh, oftentimes your social worker or dietitian, depending on the setting, can help you navigate your insurance, your health insurance to hopefully find a more affordable option for you. Um, of course, if it's a different type of medication, then we'll need the doctor to also be in the loop. Um, but that's definitely something to not shy away from and make sure to let your health care team know. Definitely. And if I can piggyback like on that, not just if we know that certain medications, especially the binders that people are prescribed, those tend to be very expensive medications. But remember that sometimes, even if your prescription only is a few dollars, we know that if you're taking 10, 15, 20 different medications, they all can have different costs. So even if your medication is $4 or $5 and that's a burden for you, don't hesitate to bring that up to your team as well, because sometimes we do have options and alternatives that we can offer. And I was going okay. to piggyback off what had been said before and bringing up the nurses, that's really important because one of the things that you want to do is also make sure I tend to go through my nurses for everything. First off, when I get in there, any questions I have or anything like that, because the nurses can go to the doctor and advocate for me as well. If there's something that right. the doctor is not willing to do or not listening to, because the nurses already have that information. They already know me. So I do think the nurses have a lot more to do than as patients we really realize. And back to the to the medicine, if you can't afford that, make sure you speak with the social worker because there are copay cards, there are different things that can be done and the social workers have that information. But yes, please leverage your nurse as much as you leverage your doctor. That's my opinion as a patient. Great. Great, wonderful. So I have a question next up for Kathy. 
from Emily. My doctor tells me what not to eat, but how do I know what, what I can actually eat? That's a really good question. And I'm so glad you have that <laughs> mindset um, because oftentimes when we were told not to eat, like you're only given a list of things not to eat. Yeah. Life seems a bit more dim and less enjoyable. So to change your perspective and focus on things that you can eat, there's actually a, a huge array. Um, in this setting, I won't be able to give you particular, like specific recommendations because it is um, dependent upon your particular labs, how your kidneys are functioning um, and able to process foods. So it would be best to ask your dietitian if you don't have one that you're currently working with. You can ask your doctor to refer you to see a dietitian to, to extensively go over what you can have. Oh, and another good resource um, is that AKF does have um, a database of a lot of recipes. So that's also a place you can go to to find things that you can eat. Okay, great. The next question is for Nicole. Um, can you talk a bit about what you've done to help communication, um, to help communication between the different people on the kidney care team and help them talk to each other? Sure. Not the top one. one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> it is. But like I said, the first thing that I do is uh, make sure that I get the information, tell the, tell the nurse everything. Because believe it or not, when you think about it, the nurse is somewhat of the center and the key to everything, bringing everything together because the nurse has the medical background and also they deal with things on a more on a one-on-one -on -one basis than the nephrologist will when they hear a gamut of, of things. So I make sure that I have the nurse, um, you know, to know exactly what's going on with me. Also, when I'm speaking with my doctor, I tell my doctor everything that's going on with me, as I stated before, not just with kidney care, but also just my regular PC, things that are going on. I want them to be aware of everything. I also make sure that I personally keep, and I know in the time of technology and things like that, paper is not what's ideal, but I make sure I have a list of every doctor that I've been to, every surgery that I've had. I mean, it's almost a book at this point. But I have that information. So because a lot of times they'll ask, have you done this or have you done that? And I can just simply refer back. I also make sure when I start going to a new nephrologist or new doctor, I provide them with a copy of that so they can see my background at an easy glance. Um, it does take some time getting to get that together when you think about everything that you've done, especially um, from example, I've been uh, uh, I've had CKD for about 18 years at this point. Um, but there are things that I tend to forget also. So by having this list, I make sure they're able to see this, see the list of everything that I've gone through. So I make sure that I have a communication with the nurse. I make sure that I do reach and speak with the dietitian, the social workers, and I just touch base with everyone. Even if I don't have to physically have a meeting with them, that particular thing, I will go by their office and just wave just to let them know, hey, I'm here if there's anything I need. I think one of the um, key things is making sure that um, I've let everybody know that I care about myself and I wanna do what's best for me. And by doing that, I think that makes them feel like they wanna do what's best for me also. But those are the uh, tips that I have for making sure that your care team is with you. Oh, those are, that's really great advice. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone else on the panel have suggestions? Um, I definitely, I know that I struggle with this even as a provider. How do you get, you know, your your members of the care team to talk to each other? I may offer some additional um, to echo, first of all, what Nicole said, which is great and just very insightful. I think that admittedly within healthcare, um, because things are complex sometimes, um, there isn't the communication that there needs to be, and we're working on fixing it, but I'd argue that we need to get there faster. So in the meantime, I think, you know, we're asking patients to do a lot to reach out to us. So what I've tried to do is provide a way for my team 
to be able to access and reach out to me. Now, everybody can do that in their individual sense, whether they're a patient or provider. Um, I do it with some kind of open office hours when, when I'm not in clinic or doing clinical activities. I also would say that not only are we using portal messages um, from patient to provider, but that's a great cue for me to then involve my other colleagues in nursing, social work, uh, dietitians, and um, so forth. Everybody that we've talked to on the session and even beyond, because I'm looping them into this great messaging that the patient has given me. And if all I'm saying to the patient is what they are need to avoid with their diet, this is an opportunity when the patient reaches out as well as a reminder, hey, Dr. Wright, you're going to talk to me a little bit more about diet, then I'll loop in colleagues from the team. So I guess what I'm saying is trying to leverage that technology, not only to help, help at the patient provider interface, but at our interface while we're working together as well. So that, that actually might relate to the next question I actually had for you, Dr. Wright Nunez. It said, how does my doctor talk to other people on the care team? Um, and so it sounds like electronic communication is still is one of the most common ways. Um, do you ever um, pick up the phone and, and call, maybe if they're not in the same health system as you? Does that happen a lot or not so much? Right. That's a great question. And I think that it depends. Um, so if I am uh, in clinic in person, or you could even suggest say inpatient, then uh, I am absolutely trying to do more face-to-face -face communication, especially if there's something that has a risk for falling through the cracks or is really triaged as important to myself or my patients, then I will take the opportunity with folks who are here on staff, my nursing team, um, dietitian. Uh, now in this era, again, of a pandemic, it's really challenged us. So some of that I've had to convert because I don't have a multidisciplinary team who's necessarily on site or even at the site I'm at. Some of us may work as providers at multiple sites. So that's where I'm using the secure messaging, uh, whether in the electronic uh, record or otherwise, and then also picking up the phone and paging. I'd say a great point that you make, um, Dr. Green, is that you know what happens when communication needs to go um, maybe across systems or state lines, uh, which I've had, or even beyond that. That's again, where I'm picking up the phone. I've got to set aside the time to make sure I can have a good conversation, um, but we'll, we'll do that as well. So I think it's a great question and I don't mean to be fuzzy about it, but I think it does depend on the situation. And I think the, the bottom line is we have to use all of these and really individualize it to what uh, we're triaging at that moment and what the patient's needs are. That's great. Well, and I wonder if that ties a little bit back to what Nicole said about keeping a list of, you know, all your care and your doctors and having their phone numbers um, is probably very helpful. If you do need to contact someone from outside the system, um, then and the I think patient already has thing, those phone numbers. Yeah, no, that's okay. That's helped. That saves you a step anyways. And the point Nicole brings up is just huge because what, again, it's not exactly right but sometimes the only common denominator in the patient's care is that one patient, right? Sometimes they're hopping across health systems or you know, they have illnesses that span so many disciplines. And not only is it within a kidney care team, but across many care teams. So somebody doing that like Nicole or otherwise is just such a great thing. And if people can't, you know, we understand that we should be able to rise to the occasion, but, but knowing that you are the link um, is, is critical. So I really, really appreciated what um, Nicole had said and the other folks as, as to these suggestions. Yeah. Yes. All right, great. I have a question for Shauna. Um, there's so much to remember, it's overwhelming. What can the social worker do to help? I think that a lot of social workers have put their own tools in place to be organized because we have a lot of tasks on our plate, whether it's the number of patients we're seeing or the number of facilities we cover. So we have ways that we can help you stay organized. You know, we can teach you about different technology options. We can help navigate some of those systems for you. We advocate on your behalf, whether that's reaching out for outside resources or transplant centers, you know, staying in contact with those other facilities. So we can certainly give you some suggestions how to get organized. Um, we have different strategies. And again, remember that 
even though you may only have one social worker who's assigned to you, a lot of our social workers are part of a bigger kidney community. Either they have other social workers at the providers that they work for or the um, Council of Nephrology social workers, and they can reach out to other social workers to try to get novel ideas, other ways that'll help you. And you know, don't be afraid if you, they try something with you and it doesn't work, don't be afraid to say, hey, you know, I tried your suggestion and it just didn't work for me. What else do you have? And we can usually come up with a plan B and a plan C and a plan D, and we'll keep working with you until we can figure out something that actually is going to be effective. That's really helpful and such a good question. Um, I think that a lot of patients struggle with that and don't think to ask. So that's that's really nice. That's Nice to hear that you have some resources as well and advice. Um, okay, question for Carrie. What can I do if I can't afford my medications? Oh gosh, I'm gonna leverage back to your social worker. <laughs> I'm gonna leverage back to the, hard one the, too. The, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to the American Kidney Fund. There are so many resources that are available when you cannot afford your medication. So I'll start with this. Just as Nicole said, corner your nurse, start having that conversation, go over what your struggles are. Then she will get the interdisciplinary team. Who we do we need to tackle to the side? Do we need to bring in Shauna and a social worker that can find different funds where we can, you know, help you with that? And, and just share your information. There are so many avenues to help you with medication from your binders to your ESA, whatever that might be. There are a lot, a lot of avenues to help and assist with medication expense. And then so again, on the just, panel. we have, we have yeah. so many, mm -hmm. depend, you know, it's going to be patient specific based on insurance. So the social worker is always going to work with you around the type of coverage that you currently have, because that's going to open up different avenues, different opportunities for assistance. Sometimes we're going to recommend, you know, applying for a state Medicaid program, because that's pretty comprehensive in terms of assisting with multiple medications. Or if you have Medicare, it might be applying for the limited income subsidy, the LIS or extra help as some people know it. And again, that's going to span all of your medications instead of being a specific drug assistance program. But there are copay cards if you have commercial coverage and there are assistance programs through the different drug manufacturers. And there are other programs that are out there, again, based on your specific set of circumstances. And as I mentioned, you know, it doesn't have to be that the medication is a couple hundred dollars. It could be simply that you're on multiple medications and just even a few dollars is too expensive. So don't hesitate to ask if you run into that type of problem. You know, again, you can also ask your pharmacist if when you go to fill the medication, if it comes as sticker shock, ask, is there a less expensive way to get this medication? They're a great starting point. But again, always bring it back to your team because we are aware of a lot of different avenues for assistance that are out there. And can I just add, this if, was a clear oh, yeah. example. This was a clear example of how the interdisciplinary team worked together. One question mm -hmm. came from a patient <laughs> asking about struggle of financial, and I know on this team, I'm gonna leverage in my social worker. This is why we say, share your information, ask the questions, because whatever that resource is, we'll try to tackle it together. Great. And I think um, as a patient, I, might... I do want to, yeah. Okay, I was going to say, as a patient, one of the things that um, people have come to me and ask kidney patients, they tend to run out of medicine. So an important thing is to make sure that you order your medication early, at least seven days before you run out. So you can avoid these things and possibly get them worked on before that. Good point. Yes, and I think that's, in fact, I was going to bring up a lot of my patients, sometimes patients are the ones who have the best information and suggestions for how to get medications paid for. Yeah. So don't That's forget true. that. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, good. So in follow up to this question, I just wanted to see if anyone on the panel could comment on maybe um, in thinking about finances and medications, how things differ when you are, if you ha are not on dialysis or you are on dialysis and how that might um, change your resources. I think sometimes patients don't realize that it, it may change. Is that correct? Yeah. 
Again, I think, you know, every situation is specific based on what your available resources are in terms of your own financial situation and what your insurance coverage is. So there are programs out there, whether you're on dialysis or not, and a great resource, if you don't have a social worker that you can reach out to, reach out to the team, your physician's team, whether it's the nurse or even the secretary who answers the phone and coordinates appointments, they can probably put you in touch. A lot of the nephrologists in terms of communication with clinics, I've had our nephrologist office reach out to me over the years and say, hey, I have someone who hasn't started treatment yet, but this is the problem they're running into. And again, under those circumstances, I'm more than happy to offer any information that I have available about what that person could potentially apply for. So we tend to work pretty closely with their office. Um, So that's another option for you. So even if you don't have a social worker, sometimes you might still have access to one. Perfect. Okay, great. I do think, so the one thing that bears mentioning too, if I might just interject, I just, uh, everybody who just responded, I think has come up with great ideas and, and, and directing to the right people who I too have leveraged the social worker and my nursing team and just everybody who's been mentioned. I think what sometimes we as providers might not have our radar up on as much, um, which we should, is the difficulties um, patients have paying for medications. I'm not saying that we don't know it's an issue, but everybody's individual. So I think one of the key things that was mentioned is just making sure people know if it is an issue um, or even if it isn't. You know, we've had patients in my clinic and again, working with multidisciplinary team where my wonderful social worker was the person who asked the specific question at the visit and was able to identify several needs that I didn't. Um, So I think that, again, leveraging all the folks in the team and just letting somebody know if and when it is an issue, and sometimes just beforehand, even if it isn't, if there's just general questions. Okay, great, thank you. So actually the next question is for you, Dr. Ray Nunez. Um, How can I advocate for myself when I feel my nephrologist is not providing me proper care? Um, The doctor in my dialysis center doesn't seem to provide enough attention. Yeah, I think that unfortunately, um, it it kind of hurts me to hear that um, for not only the person who's asking the question, but because I I bet if we asked a bigger sample of folks, there might be a lot of folks out there feeling similarly, or at least some. And so I'm sorry, first of all, that that is the case. And I think um, maybe one of the things that I'm hearing kind of throughout this session is advocacy. And um, if a provider isn't giving maybe the time or um, the responses that a person wants, a patient, I'd say first, empower yourself to let that person know that. That's not going to be this rosy fix in all cases, and I know that. But I think sometimes... uh, again, be it right or wrong, and it's really wrong, if people are trying to get through certain tasks or see folks in a day, then maybe they need somebody to say, you know what, Um, you've taken your time with other folks, now's now's the opportunity to take time with me, mentioning that. And I would say any any provider that should be a provider uh, giving good care would listen to that. And to provide you time, if not at that moment, they should circle back in that time or that day and make sure that you're listened to and heard. If it's a chronic issue, if there's staff at the center or whether it be a clinic or center that you feel comfortable with that you do interface with, escalating to that individual. And then I think a reality, which maybe we don't like to talk about, but we should more in the medical community is that, uh, again, one of the things that Nicole mentioned, um, you know what, I think maybe I need to consider if care with another provider either here or elsewhere is really what's right for me. I know that can be challenging, it can be scary, but with that advocacy comes, I think, empowerment, because again, you are the common denominator in your care. You know your body and your needs best. And that can be, care can be switched or coordinated, whether it be outpatient clinics or within center to center if somebody's receiving dialysis. Um, So that's kind of covering the spectrum. And I guess what I'm saying is trying to first work with your provider if you feel comfortable, but if you feel like that rapport can't be achieved, no matter what avenue you are taking, I do think it's okay to start advocating that maybe it needs to be with another person 
and I don't mean to sound harsh, um, and certainly other folks on this session can, can give their opinions, um, but that's care that I would want for anybody, whether they're my patient or loved one or myself. Okay, great. So I think we have time for just a few more questions. Um, the next one is for Kathy. Um, and actually two somewhat related questions. What's the easiest way for me to find a dietitian or nutritionist? And, um, and can nurses refer me or can only a doctor refer me to a dietitian? Those are great questions. Um, for the first one, I think a good place to start is asking, actually, I'll answer the second one first, because it sounds like in if one has um, a desire to see a dietitian who to go to, either you can go to your nurse or, or social worker, but what happens behind the scene is what they'll do is let the doctor know, and then the doctor will need to refer out um, and which brings me to the first question, um, where to find a dietitian. Once with the referral, I guess it's depending on your insurance. With the referral, um, a good place to start is to ask your doctor, because a doctor's office might know, depending on your insurance, who you can see that's covered within your insurance, um, or perhaps your doctor's office or health health. Um, group already has dietitians within that group that they'll refer you to. Um, and so that's a good place to start your doctor's office. Um, and then if they're not sure or they're asking you to perhaps suggest someone that you would like to see, one place that you can go to is the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Their website would um, you can search for dietitians in your area. And so you'll be able to find even renal specific dietitians or um, various specialties. From that site, you can um, find someone who you can call up or go to and see if your insurance will cover. Okay, thank you for that. I think we're, uh, we have about five minutes left. Um, so I think I'm gonna stop taking um, questions from the group at this time, um, but this has been such a great discussion and I wanna thank all the panelists for their time. Before we wrap up though, I wanna give each of you a chance to share your final thoughts. So what are the main takeaways you want kidney patients to know about working with their care team? Why don't I start with Nicole? <laughs> Sure. I think the one takeaway that I want to give is to make sure that you are leveraging and incorporating everyone that's available in your care team. Make sure that you let everyone know what's going on with you with every aspect of your life, not just renal, but anything that you can think of. Because sometimes we forget that although I may have something that may not appear to be renal, it may be a condition of or something of that nature. Also making sure that you speak with your physician and let them know, you know, any issues or concerns that you that you do have. And that's my takeaway, just to make sure that you are a big advocate for yourself and you also get other people in those clinics or in those um, transplant centers to be your advocate as well. Okay, great. Thanks, Nicole. How about you, Carrie? I'm gonna say ditto. And, and just expand a little bit longer and say, communicate, communicate, communicate. Being your own advocate and speaking up and letting us know how you're feeling, what your signs and symptoms are, if you're having issues with medications, if you're having issues with prescription, if you're having issues communicating, let us know because we don't know what we don't know. Be your own advocate communicate your needs, and we will direct it in the right area to get you some help. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Kathy, do you have any final thoughts? Mm, I feel like I'll be repeating, but basically <laughs> you okay. are your best advocate. Be honest with your healthcare team. Um, with your challenges, with your goals, so that we can best work alongside you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And Shauna? I think I'd just like to remind everyone that 
you know, your entire team becomes a support partner for you. And all of us look at every symptom that you report through a different lens. We all have a different perspective based on our education and training, our years of experience, sometimes even our own personal experiences. So we can work together to put that puzzle together and figure out the best way to try to help you work through your symptoms or any challenges you're facing. So use every opportunity that you have, whether it's when your team members come around for rounding, whether it's simply someone asking you in the morning, hey, how are you? Instead of giving the answer, oh, I'm fine, because we all basically say I'm fine or I'm good. Use those opportunities to bring up those questions and concerns that you have. Use those care plan meetings, you know, any opportunity that you have. And if you're afraid to advocate for yourself, maybe it's just not something you've done in the past, partner with your social worker, because again, they can help you work through that teach you ways of reaching out to your team, how to communicate, how to ask those questions until you feel comfortable doing it on your own. Thank you. And finally, Julie, any final thoughts? Sure. I think um, one of the things that we've emphasized on this session is just the diversity related to all of the people who are hoping to provide you excellent care. And just knowing one, that that is an opportunity and it exists, and it may not look the same at every uh, system, but just knowing that there's a cadre, not only of physicians, but nursing, dietitians, pharmacy, social work um, here and ready to support you. And then I'd only uh, echo the advocating, you know your body best. And so continue to feel empowered to do that or helps uh, get some help with some of your family or any of us who can help you as well. Thank you. Wow. Um, it sounds like what I keep hearing is just, you know, advocate for yourself, for patients to feel comfortable advocating for themselves and that there's so many resources available that they may not know. So this is very encouraging. Um, but thank you all again for spending this time with us today and providing your expert advice and input. And thanks to everyone at home for, um, also for joining us or if you're at work, <laughs> uh, wherever you may be. If you, if you aren't already, please follow us on Facebook or send us an email through kidneyfund.org and you'll be the first to know about other resources like this one. Our final session today will be coming up at 3 p.m. Eastern time and we'll focus on stage three chronic kidney disease and what you need to know. I hope you'll join us for it. Once we conclude this session, you will see a link for a quick survey up here in green below the screen. Please take a few minutes to fill it out and tell us how we did. Your feedback will be very useful as we plan future sessions. So thanks, everyone. Um, have a great day. <laughs>